everybody. So someone on TikTok asked me, how diversified should my portfolio be? And the answer is super diversified. The reason you want a really diversified portfolio is because the goal is to protect yourself. Let me move this up a little bit. The goal is to protect yourself from certain cyclical events or sector-wide events. Like, so say hypothetically, you're all in oil stocks. That's all you have. Oil stocks, gas stations, oil production, refinery, all those everything to do with oil and then let's say there is some sort of natural disaster and the oil fields or the you know production is halted all of your oil stocks will get hammered yeah it's a temporary thing right um in this scenario but in other things it can be you know that that way of doing business is slowly dying off and if you're in one heavily specific sector that like, let's say with these electric vehicles, we're gonna use and produce less oil, natural gas, stuff like that. Gradually over time, some of these companies will adapt and they will find new ways to be profitable, but some of these companies will probably cease to exist. If you are in a very heavy oil and natural gas um, portfolio, that could spell trouble for you. And that's why you wanna have a very diversified portfolio. But there's more to it than just having a variety of different sectors, you want different kinds of investments as well. So you want to have your high growth stocks, especially in boom times, right? When the market is, is having a rally, when there's a bull market, those grow or, or the economy is expanding. That's when these growth stocks are really going to flourish. And so you want to have a handful of them in your portfolio. Most financial advisors recommend having anywhere between 20 and 30 investments, period, right? Anything more and it's hard to manage, right? Someone said, oh, I have 100, 100 different stocks in my portfolio. That might be a little hard to manage. Um, if you have too few, then you're not exposed to enough variety. And that could also, you know, you're, you're basically, if you're buying like two or three different stocks, um, if you're wrong on those stocks, or they underperform, or they just kind of like steadily perform over the years, you could be missing out on opportunities to have been in other sectors or stocks or kinds of investments that have done very well. You never know which ones are gonna be the winners. You also never know which ones are gonna be the losers. That's why you wanna be diversified. So in addition to having your high growth stocks for really good times, you want your boring dividend stocks for quiet times. The reason is that those really boring stocks have withstood the test of time. Many of these companies have been around over a hundred years. They know how to do this by now. They've got the capital to get through downturns, right? Most recessions are anywhere from a year, 18 months, whatever like that, to more significant downturns. And you look at a company like General Electric, which has been around forever, and they got, GE got to the point where they were so big that it was hard to manage. They had everything. I mean, a company like GE never really went anywhere, the stock, because they had so many different businesses, right? They had airlines, they had household products, they had banking, they had film, they had, I mean, they had everything. So when, when they had a good earnings report, it was like big deal because they owned so many different other companies that it was hard to move the needle on a stock like that. However, when they were in trouble, it's very easy for a stock like that to plummet because look at all the different brands they own. And if multiple sectors or businesses are in trouble, uh-oh, and they had mismanagement uh, alongside that problem, it's too hard to manage. It reminds me of Chipotle. Chipotle opens up and they're like, oh, we have, you know, I mean, there was a time where there wasn't even a Chipotle in New York City, right? And I would, I would love to go to New York to visit my grandma, but then I would be like, there's no Chipotle here, this sucks. That's how it was. They had like one in DC where I live, none in New York. They had a few all over the country and then they started expanding and that was great. They were expanding, their stock started to do really well and then they started over expanding, right? They were opening up locations faster than they could keep up with. And so what ended up happening? It became too hard to manage because they had, instead of just, you know, a few, a few stores here and there, they had so many that they were like, uh, and they had issues, right? You remember they had that salmonella problem. They had rats falling from the ceilings at, at certain locations. They had rats in the restaurant running through dining rooms. Um, the quality of the food has gone downhill. The um, 
the quality of the staff has also gone downhill. They, they seem to not really give a shit about anything. It's dirty. Um, I, I went in every once in a while, I'll go to Chipotle, right? Every once in a while, I'm like, man, I want a burrito and I'll go in. And then I get home and I'm like, why did I do this? It's so disappointing. Um, I usually walk in and I'll like, I'll order my burrito and I'll be like, uh, white rice, black beans, and steak. And they white rice, black beans, and they slide it down and they look into the steak container and they look up at me and they go, uh, we're out of steak. And I'm like, well, what are you telling me for? Tell a guy behind you. And they turn around and they're like, you know, do you have any steak? And he's like, I can put it on right now. And then he puts on the steak on the grill and it's like, how are you not... You know, so that's the problem when you become too big. When you become too big because you have to appease Wall Street, right? You keep having to have blowout quarters. That's how it is in this game. Uh, you can't have a quarter where it was slow or quiet or disappointing. You have to keep delivering big quarters. And so Chipotle felt that pressure and they started to overexpand. And then they opened this new restaurant called Shop House, which was like a Southeast Asian kind of street food kind of place. They started in DC and then they expanded out and it was so good. But at the same time, they were having the salmonella and the rats falling from ceilings. And they were like, we have too many locations, close down shop house, let's focus on Chipotle. And they also closed down a bunch of underperforming shop house locations. They were in real trouble. The stock went from like 700 to 300. It was all over. People were like, oh, they're done, it's over. Um, now I think it's like $1,300 a share. So they've, they've come back, they're just fine. The point to all of this is overexpansion. Companies that overexpand. And so you don't know as an investor which one you're picking, right? You pick three or four stocks, you might be in some really great stuff or you might not be. You might think, oh, I'm picking General Electric. How could you go wrong with this? And then sure enough, you know, the stock got hammered over these last like five, six years. Nobody took it seriously. Now it seems like they might be coming back slowly, but that's five or six years that you could potentially be sitting in a loser stock while something else is moving along. Now, the other thing is you don't want to get into too many stocks, right? Because like I said, that can be hard to manage. I feel like a lot of people have that, that fear of missing out, right? They got FOMO and they go like, it could be this one or it could be that one and I don't know, so I'm just going to buy all of them. In, in that kind of case, uh, you're much better off buying like a broad market S&P 500 index fund. So you can have a little bit of everything because the, the likelihood that you're going to pick, if you're only investing in a few companies, that you're going to pick three runaway stocks um, that are going to make you a millionaire and help you retire is slim to none. That's, again, the purpose of diversification. So you have your growth stocks, you have your, your, um, your boring dividend paying stocks over here. So in great times, your growth stocks are going to do well. In bad times, your um, your growth stocks won't do well, but your boring stocks will, and your boring stocks will also pay you a dividend. So you're gonna be making a little bit of money even though markets are kind of quiet or reversed. And these boring stocks go down less than the growth stocks because say, for example, they're tightening how much they're willing to loan to these companies. Growth stocks depend on taking loans to expand because they don't have the capital. So they slow down when interest rates go up or the rate or or they become um, a little less likely to give out these hefty loans because maybe the economic times are going to be bad. Growth stocks really start to slow down, but the boring stocks are, even if they don't go anywhere, they're not going down and that's good. And they will, they will likely go down a little bit, which presents a great buying opportunity for you to average in and buy more shares at a lower price because you know, again, these companies have proven the test of time. They've been around forever. So you add to these companies when they're getting hammered. You add to your growth stocks. Although, you know, if the recession is really bad, some of them might not make it out alive or they might get bought out by competitors because, hey, at this point, you know, one of these big companies over here can look over at the growth companies and go, we might be able to uh, add a cool tech company to our boring, you know, our boring uh portfolio or our boring companies and you know we're all holding like soap and shampoo these companies the boring companies they they never have downturns they're not cyclical stocks they're good all year because they make band-aids they make shampoo they make soap they make toothpaste you don't you don't only use toothpaste during the summer right you 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 use it all year um so you've got 
growth, your boring stuff. You want to have some mutual funds over here, more like broad market stuff. And most importantly, dividends should be reinvested for everything. Just keep reinvesting those dividends. It's going to be a slow, agonizing process, right? If you have 100 shares in a company, you're maybe going to walk away with one or two shares a year. But you keep adding to that position, right? Using either dollar cost averaging or, you know, buying a couple more shares every year. One of the things I always say is when people say like, oh, it's a birthday, it's a holiday, and my parents are going to ask what I want, tell them you want money. I know it makes a lot of people uncomfortable in this country to say, give me money, I want money. Ask for money. Ask for the money. And instead of buying crap that you don't need that's going to sit in your closet, funnel it into your investments. Cut back, live below your means. Every time you don't go out for dinner, you know you know what your average restaurant bill is, right? It's been 70 bucks, 100 bucks, whatever you spend. If you don't go out for dinner, you take that money and you put it in your stocks. You put it in your mutual fund. You put it in your ETF. If you are at the store and you're looking at that new pair of Nikes and they're $200 and you go, you know, I don't really need these. You can buy that stock instead or you can buy any stock that you want. Add to your position, a couple shares, a couple shares. It adds up, I promise you. In the beginning, it seems like small potatoes, especially if you're new and you want to get rich quick and you're watching all these guys on Instagram saying, oh, I'm a day trader and I have a Lamborghini. The reason they have that Lamborghini and the reason that they're a successful day trader is because they're charging you access to themselves or to their Discord or to their website or to their course. And that's where they're making their money. They're making their money from their hundreds, if not thousands of subscribers paying hundreds of dollars a month or a thousand per year. That's where their money's coming from. They're not rich because they're great traders. They're rich because they're great salespeople. Anyway, don't fall for those kind of scams. I know it's tempting because you want to get rich quick. And I know the thought of a long-term investment, one share at a time, two share, oh, a little teeny dividend, oh, seems agonizing. But the younger you are, the more time you have to build up this position. And I promise if you do it correctly, you will have a higher quality of life. You'll be able to retire a lot earlier. And you'll be able to then at that point live off your dividends, right? You hear a lot of elderly people say, live off my dividends because they've been investing all their life. They don't have 100 shares. They have 3,000 shares of whatever the company may be. And of course, when we're talking about a diversified portfolio, the last part of it is you want to have some money, a very small amount set aside for the very high risk stuff. Because like we said earlier, you never know what's going to take off and what's going to be the big stock of the future. And you might be looking at some very high risk stocks right now going, maybe, but you know, more likely than not, maybe not. But it doesn't hurt to throw a little bit in and just buy and hold some high risk stuff. 10 years from now, 20 years from now, maybe it, maybe it pays off. Maybe it doesn't. The last thing I'll talk about is... Uh, this this rule to determine how many um, what percentage of your portfolio should be stocks versus what percentage of your portfolio should be something safer like bonds. Um, essentially, all you want to do is subtract your age from the number one hundred. So if you are twenty and you subtract twenty from one hundred, eighty eighty percent is what your portfolio should be in stocks. You should be eighty percent in stocks because you have more time. Since you are so young, you have more time to see the benefits of this. But also, you you have more time for recovery in the event that there's a recession or even a General Electric kind of story. You buy General Electric, it goes down. You hold maybe you know maybe over the next ten years they 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 sell off some of their their underperforming businesses or they raise capital or they you know they cut down on how much they're acquiring like GE, GE has been doing and. Before you know it, GE starts to slowly come back because they've they've downsized, right? We're not the only people who should be living below our means. But the last point to that is, if you're if you're say um, say you're you're sixty years old, then your portfolio should be forty percent in stocks because the likelihood of slumps or recessions or downturns could mean that you could be out of some great investments, and you might need that money for retirement. Maybe you have a company that uh, cuts dividends, has really bad, um, really bad news, really bad news. I'm not talking about just one bad earnings, but consistently bad earnings to the point where they're mounting debt, they have to cut dividends, 
they've got mismanagement. And that company that you as a 60 year old were looking forward to retiring off of is now getting hammered and it's eating into your profits. It's eating into your gains. You're freaking out because I was going to retire and use that money. And now, you know, that's why it's important to be less in stocks the older you get. Although since people are living longer, maybe that, that number will change. Anyway, I hope you thought this video was helpful. If you did, please hit the bell. Please hit the subscribe. Thanks for watching. Enjoy your weekend and have a nice day.